I'm going to talk about how Yeshua walked out Passover. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about how he is prophetically represented in Passover and what that means to us as the body of Messiah. Um, whether we're a natural branch or a grafted in branch, uh, we all hang on the same tree. And um, I uh, was born into uh, a Jewish family. Um, I was adopted uh, at age five into a Gentile family. Um, and uh, so I understand adoption. Um, in fact, when my, when my uh, birth father um, passed away, um, I got to lead him to the Lord on his deathbed. When he passed away, I spoke at his funeral. It was one of the very first times I spoke. And um, he, uh, as I shared about him being my adoptive father, a lot of my uh, cousins, many of them who were younger than me, had no idea that I was even adopted. It was, a, it was a shocking moment for them because I was so fully integrated into the family. I was uh, completely a Van Landigam, uh, uh, even though I was born a Zeret. And... Uh, and this is the prophetic picture of the kingdom, you know, of wild branches being grafted in amongst the remnant of believing branches. And uh, so much so that, uh, you know, uh, all this inheritance that belongs to me as a natural branch belongs to you equally. Um, it's a part of your heritage, your spiritual heritage, and uh, you're free to partake of this um, and the blessing of it, of what it represents and what it is. And so I, w- I want to encourage you in that. Um, and, uh, and in fact, you know, Paul uses the analogy of the olive tree. Um, I don't know if you know, but if you take a, uh, a tangerine branch and graft it into a lemon tree, if the graft takes, it's still going to make tangerines. But the olive tree, when you graft into it, um, a non-native branch, now you can't graft any branch into any tree, but if, it, if, if it's a branch that can be grafted in, um, it no longer makes the fruit of its tree of origin, but it makes the fruit of the root. And this is the prophetic picture of the nations being engrafted in amongst the commonwealth of believing Israel. And so this is the prophetic picture of the one new man that Paul talks about. And I believe that we're in a season, before we get into this, um, that what the prophet Zechariah prophesied about in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. He said, Ten men from every nation and every language would come and grab hold of the Jew by the corner of his garment and say, let us go with you, for God is with you. Now, if you read the, the book of Zechariah, the whole thing's about the prophetic restoration of Israel and the end times battle over Jerusalem, if you read chapters 12 to 14. Um, and the nations, of the governments of the world coming against um, Israel, and in particular Jerusalem. But ahead of that, in chapter 8, he talks about ten men from every nation and every language. Well, how do you get ten men from every nation and every language? Well, what, what that is, from the Hebraic mindset, from the Hebrew context, what the scriptures come to us from, ten is a minion. Whenever they start a new synagogue or a new congregation, you have to have at least ten, a minion. So what Zechariah is talking about is a minion, a complete congregation representative of every tribe, tongue, and nation that's going to come and connect to Israel in the last days for her restoration. And I believe that's what we're seeing begin to happen today. And so I want to I share a little bit about that with you uh, tonight and as we go into Messiah and the Passover. So before I go, I want to share a few traditions that I have with you. This is uh, from a famous movie, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Tradition, tradition. Well, I have a few traditions, and uh, my people, we, we're known for our traditions. And uh, my tradition is, is at the front of it to give honor uh, to the Lord and, so, um, and honor a few things. And the first is, is where Messiah is lifted up, that he will draw men to himself. John twelve thirty two, Yeshua is the Messiah. And if we would lift up him, that he would draw all men unto himself. And uh, so, Lord, we, we just uh, lay hold of that promise tonight where Yeshua, where the Messiah is lifted up, um, that you would draw them in unto yourself. And we pray that you would in this very place. Um, salvation um, came through Yeshua on the cross. And this is what a prophetic picture of Passover is. Um, it, it, it's not by our works, um, lest any man should boast as Rav Shaul, the um, Apostle Paul spoke. Um, but it's by the shed blood of Yeshua in fulfillment of Passover. And uh, in addition to that, the Bible is the Word of God. When you came in here tonight and you sat down on your chair, did you study the chair or did you just sit in the chair? You just sat in it. It's an act of faith. You sat in it believing the chair is going to hold you up. And this Word will hold you up. In fact, here in Texas, uh, just the county over in Johnson County, we have an international treasure, not just a national treasure. 
there's only five complete sets of the Tanakh, that's the Hebrew Old Testament, um, in the world on ancient scrolls. The Vatican has three. Hobby Lo owners of Hobby Lobby have one. And Johnson County for Israel, the Christian Heritage Foundation, have a set and a half. And, um, and it's the only one in the world that you can see. In fact, there's only seven psalm scrolls in the world. They have two of them. Um, but this is a, a, an excerpt of Passover in the Desert written on a um, Torah scroll, the section of Numbers, uh, chapter 8, um, from about 250 years ago, written in Aleppo, Syria. And then this, yeah, yeah. And then this um, is Israel's journey out of Numbers 32. And this was written in Yemen about 500 years ago. Um, on deerskin, which most Torah scrolls are on deerskin. There's other skins that are used. Um, but they, the thing I want to point out to you is, is the precision with which the word was preserved by the Jewish people is absolutely stunning and amazing. In fact, if you take um, a, a portion written 200 years ago in Poland and that same portion written 500 years ago in Yemen, you could practically line the letters up if you were to line the pages up and line up the letters. That's the precision. And you're talking about different people, hundreds of years of separation, thousands of miles of separation. And um, try writing your name three times and lining the letters up. Um, um, this, is, this is the miracle of the word. And this is just a, a, a couple uh, pieces that have made, it, made their way here. And then I also have this picture here, which is an heirloom for our family. Um, this is, was taken in the late 1800s, and this is uh, of the Western Wall, which some call the Wailing Wall. The floor now is much lower, um, uh, and uh, but this is a. It, I look at this picture every day on my desk, and it just screams restoration. God is in the greatest hour of restoration. When Israel was born again as a nation 70 years ago, this year. So the Bible is the Word of God. And the last thing I want to say is I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was a revivalist of the, the Third Great Awakening, every time he would go up to the altar, he would say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I want to declare tonight that in this house, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And so we want to honor His presence, not mine, His presence, because the promise in the Word is where two or three are gathered, that there He is also. So Lord, we honor Your presence here tonight. We invite You into this place. We ask that it would be Your words that would flow that you would open our hearts and make our hearts malleable to what you want to do in our hearts tonight. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the mighty name of Jesus. So let's get acquainted. I'm going to go through this super fast because I want to get to the heart and soul of, of tonight. But there's some things that I think are important before we jump into this because we're in what I would consider a very prophetic year. So this is my family. Uh, I've got six kids. Um, and uh, my kids are hard after the Lord. And... Uh, Got one moving to Uganda, one that's uh, on the mission field in Serbia. Uh, my oldest one lived in Israel for six months. Um, and uh, we feel called back to the land. We're in the process of trying to make Aliyah, gain our is Israeli citizenship and live in the land and minister in the land. And this is our crew. Uh, before working with the ministry that I'm a part of out of Tel Aviv, Ma'oz Israel Ministries, um, I worked in the White House under President Bush. Um, in 2003 and four, uh, fought in Iraq. Uh, we renewed our vows during the Feast of Tabernacles in 2005. And this is me on my first time in Jerusalem at the wall. And so that's just a little bit about me. Um, I want to testify to you really quick because uh, I believe that, that there's importance and power in releasing testimonies. This is my daughter Amanda before she went to Africa a few years ago. She had like a stroke in her eye and lost vision in that eye. And... Uh, we had the elders of our congregation lay hands on her, and her eye was healed completely. In fact, here in Fort Worth, the doctor that we went to after her eye was healed, he said, if I wouldn't have seen this, I would not believe this. And he said, this healed eye is actually better than your other good eye. And so uh, it's like God gave her an upgrade in, in vision. Amen? So, and... Um, uh, and uh, just tell you a little, one more testimony... Um, so, well, God called me to go speak in, uh, in St. Louis, and I'm using my GPS, and my GPS says, if you go this way, you're going to save an hour. So I go, and I end up at this, on this rural road, and I end up at this toll booth, and uh, there's, it's an unmanned toll booth that wants 65 cents. 
and I'm rummaging through my car. I got cash. I got a credit card, but no change. And I'm thinking, what genius came up with this? And uh, I'm starting to get frustrated. My son, Le- Levy, he says, Dad, don't get frustrated. He said, pray. So I prayed, and I looked out the window there in the dirt. Um, I got out, and there was a quarter, a uh, little, little sparkle in the dirt. Picked it up. It was a quarter. Underneath that was another quarter. Underneath that was a dime. Underneath that was a nickel. 65 cents. And so what I want to say is, is when God calls you to go, he'll resource you to go. And that the supernatural is, is very real and, 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 and happening today. So talking about Zechariah 8.23, there's a move going on all around the nations. Um, I go out to the Navajo every year to do a thing called Feast of Tabernacles, which you're going to learn about here in just a few minutes in the context of all of God's appointments um, and Passover. But uh, the, the, the leader of the Navajo Nation, Ben Shelley, he made a, tr- a treaty or the covenant with, with Israel. And after that, they found oil on, on the Navajo lands. Um, and, uh, and blessings started to flow. And uh, not only the Navajo, but the Cree in deep northern Canada flew into Montreal, 10 hours north of Montreal, where paved roads ended you know, about three hours into the drive. And... Um, and then afterwards, doing Feast of Tabernacles with them, 300 of the Cree went over to Israel, and the power of the Lord fell in a, in a mighty, mighty way in all of their villages. And, um, and we're in a year of mighty blessing. We just had a big meeting with Chinese house church leaders. And the one thing I want to point out to you, that, that it, blessing Israel and standing with Israel and connecting with Israel releases blessing to the body. And... Um, China was the only country during World War II that didn't turn any Jewish people away. In fact, they took in between 80 and 100,000, depending on the number, the, the group you talked to. And the thing is, is after the war was over, somewhere uh, um, about 1948, um, there were about a million Christians in China. From 1948 to 1998, the church in China grew 8,000% in a 50-year window. Um, the Youth with a Mission and the Center for World Missions estimate somewhere between... Um, 12 and 1,400 Chinese are coming to faith in Yeshua per hour, sustained revival. That's 10 million new believers a year. They have now 247 million believers in one generation. In this 70-year window of Israel's rebirth, 247 million have come into the kingdom. And now China has this huge force to connect with the Messianic movement in the land. And the Messianic movement is coming over into China, and they're having Messianic leaders teach all across China. Is it a coincidence, or is it? The promise of God, Genesis 12, 3, that I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. So this year, the 70th anniversary year, as we talk about Passover tonight, um, we have a holiday coming up called Yom Ha'atzma'ot, um, which means Independence Day in Israel, but it means more than that. In fact, the root word for Atzma'ot, for Yom Ha'atzma'ot, um, is Atzmai, which means my bones. And to me, that's a prophetic illusion that here in the word for Israel's Independence Day, is the root word for this is my bones. Well, we know in Ezekiel that the prophet Ezekiel prophesied that the dry bones would come back together. Um, and the last part of that great restoration is the breath of life coming in. And, uh, and we have a saying called, I'm Israel Kai, the people of Israel live. And so in, 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 in Hebrew, our numbers are also our letters. And so 2018 is a significant year. It means life. Um, and, uh, and it's a double portion of life because, whoops. Okay, here we go. Um, 1818 years after Hadrian kicked out the last remnants of the Jewish people um, after the Second War, um, there was the 80 70 war, and then the 130 to 135 war was the last war, and the last remnants of the Jewish people were booted from the land. 1818 years after that, um, Israel um, was born again as a nation. And we celebrate that in the year 2018. And so in the Hebrew mindset, this is a year of a triple portion of restoration of life. And, uh, and, and if you watch Israel, there's prophetic things happening. Just this past weekend, as we were on the eve of Passover, um, and as Passover was beginning, the Hamas terrorist group in the, in the Gaza Strip tried to mobilize a million people to, to breach um, the border uh, barrier in five different places. Now, they were only able to mobilize about 30,000 in five different places, but it was nothing like that had ever happened. And for the first time in history, Israeli fighter jets penetrated Iranian airspace. 
undetected. And then, on Passover, 10 meters from, from the Temple Mount, Passover sacrifice was conducted by the Kohanim, the priests for the Third Temple. And see, the thing a lot of people aren't aware of is back in 2010, they, in Mitzvah Yeriko, they began to build a replica of, of, the, of the Temple complex for, to train the Third Priesthood. They, um, they've made the garments, all the implements for the Third Temple. And, uh, and they conducted a Passover sacrifice there at the base of the Temple Mount, 10 meters from the top. Um, pretty significant um, event in Israel's 70th anniversary year. And in the midst of this, a couple more things I want to point out to you is, is um, in the church there were these prophetic people that began to talk about Trump being a Cyrus. Um, they were calling Trump a Cyrus. Hey, Trump's a Cyrus. And a lot of people didn't know what that meant. Uh, but Cyrus was the, the, the Persian king that defeated the Babylonians and made way for the Jewish people to go back and rebuild. Um, and, uh, and then the Sanhedrin minted a coin. Um, so not only Christian leaders in the United States, but the Sanhedrin um, and top rabbinic leaders were beginning to speak of Trump as a Cyrus, and the Sanhedrin minted a 1,000 coins, shekels, with Trump and Cyrus's face on it. And there's the coin right there. Call it. Now, a year ago in January, um, Ari and I were at the Chinese House Church Conference and leaders of the Iranian House Church from where Cyrus came from, we, we all converged at this Chinese House Church Conference and the prophetic word going around the, the Iranian House Church was this is the year of Cyrus. And in the hands, they presented to Ari a replica of the Cyrus cylinder with the decree for the Jewish people to rebuild and um, go back. And just like Cyrus resourced the Jewish people, the Iranian house church took up an offering of a million dollars and 120 kilos of gold and silver to bless Israel in her rebuilding. And so here in, it, in the United States, within the church, in Iran, the, the home country of Cyrus, and within Israel, the top rabbinic leaders, all unknowing at this, uh, that the, the same thing of, of Trump's being a Cyrus. And so I do believe that God has raised him up as a Cyrus and and when he made the declaration to move the U.S. Embassy, a lot of people don't realize that he, the day he made that declaration was on the 100th anniversary of the liberation of Jerusalem from Islamic rule by the British general in World War I when the Ottoman Turk Empire was defeated. And he's going to um, convene the beginning of that move on May 14th this year, which was May, May 14th, 1948, was when Israel was born again as a nation. Now, the interesting thing, in tandem with that, with that statement, a major discovery was discovered. Um, first, they found Hezekiah's, um, King Hezekiah's um, uh, signet um, imprint um, near the temple. And then they found, and this is Israel's word, the prophet Isaiah's signature. Now, why is that significant? Because the prophet Isaiah was the one who prophesied Cyrus. So in tandem with all of these people saying Trump's a Cyrus, Trump op operating prophetically like a Cyrus, the prophet who predicted Cyrus' signature is found in Israel. And then after Trump made his big declaration in December, um, on that momentous day that a lot of people didn't even realize that, what, that that was that day, seven nations, there was a big battle that played out in um, the UN, and on the eighth day of Hanukkah, when we have all nine branches of our menorah lit, our Hanukkah menorah, um, Israel, the United States, and seven other nations stood with God's prophetic plan. So one nation for each of the candlesticks for Hanukkah. And Hanukkah is the holiday where we look at the prophetic restoration of Jerusalem, Israel, and victory over the forerunner of Antichrist. And so you can't make this stuff up. All right, so let's get into Passover. First thing first I want to talk to you is, number one, right here in, in Genesis chapter 3 in the, be, in the beginning, Bereshit, um, uh, Adam and Eve sin, and what do they do? They realize that they're naked and they, they make a covering for themselves out of what? Out of leaves. And since the fall, men have been trying to make their own way to God, make their own religious systems. Um, but um, it, it records here in Genesis that the Lord made a covering for them out of animal skins. Now, there's, there's debate about this, but um, 
there's a pretty good consensus that this, this is in fact animal skins. Well, if this was animal skins and they were made by God for Adam and Eve, well, what happened to the animals that wore those skins? I mean, if you don't have your skin on anymore, guess what? You're probably not alive, right? And so this is a prophetic picture of atonement made by who? By the hand of the living God in the Ganeidon, the Garden of Eden, right in the beginning. And so God doesn't have a plan B. He only has plan A, okay? And so we go further into Genesis 15, a few more chapters in. We have Abraham, and God tells him to make a blood path. And he's going to cut these animals, and they're going to lay, lay their um, one half on one side, one half on the other, and the blood would flow down the middle. All these different animals. And then if you read in there, it tells us that um, Abraham, a dreadful and great darkness came upon him. Uh, then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain your offspring will be sojourners um, in a land that is not theirs, and they will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will pour out judgment on that nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. And so what was this? This blood path? This is how you cut covenant in the ancient world. Okay, And this is, this is the foundations of Passover, which we're going to talk to you about tonight. And so, and this is how covenant was cut. And so what, what would happen is they would cut these animals and both parties would walk the blood path um, and say, if I don't hold up my end of the agreement, let this happen to me. Okay? Well, Abraham, this great darkness comes upon him because he knows he can't walk the blood path. Well, who passes through? God passes through with a, a fire cauldron and a, and a smoke cauldron passes through. And he's the one who walks the blood path for both parties. And he gives an allusion to the Passover and the Exodus um, that was going to come 400 years after this in the context of this covenant being cut right here. And it's interesting to note that that same, you know, those same feet of God, the fire and the smoke that walked through the blood path, what did he lead the children out? A pillar of fire? by night and a pillar of cloud by day. The same, the same feet that walk the blood path are leading them 400 years out. And it's right here encoded right there in Genesis 15. Then Genesis 22, um, he tells him to take his promised son up onto the mount and sacrifice him. And uh, he's getting ready to sacrifice um, his son. And he's got the knife up in the, up in the air and the angel of the Lord stops him. And then there's a ram caught in the thicket by his his horn. And he becomes the substitutionary sacrifice. God does not have a plan B. And then finally we have the Passover um, and the Exodus out of Egypt. And um, and they they have a substitutionary sacrifice in that of a lamb that they, they sacrifice um, and they eat. Um, and the interesting thing is is um, in, in the context of Passover, you know, they had to bring the lamb in with them for two weeks. Um, on the first of Nisan, which is the beginning, the biblical New Year. Um, today in Israel, they celebrate New Year's in the fall um, uh, with the beginning of the, they call Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year in the fall. But the biblical New Year is the first of Nisan, two weeks before Passover. And from the first of Nisan to the 14th of Nisan, which was the Passover, um, they were to keep this lamb in their house. Now, when my daughter Amanda lived in Israel, um, she lived over there for almost a year, um, all total. Um, one of the families that they um, that was their neighbor were Arabs, and they had this they had this uh, goat that they they slaughtered for one of their meals. And she said the kids grew attached to it and were petting it, and it was like a pet to the family. And then it was killed. And think about this: you know, you bring a, a lamb into your home, you're observing it, you, you grow to love it. And then you've got to sacrifice it and eat it. And, and the gruesomeness and the, and the, and the intensity of what, of what this is, it, it, the prophetic picture of God's perfect sacrifice, but it's much more than that. We're going to get into that tonight. Um, and so the, the point I want to make before we get deep into Passover here is, is from the Garden of Eden all the way up till now, um, God doesn't have a plan B. He has plan A. God makes a covering out of animal skins for Adam and Eve. The blood path, Abraham couldn't walk it, but God does. Mount Moriah, God provides a substitute. 
the Exodus and Passover, God provides a substitute. The cross, Yeshua, comes and dies in our place um, in fulfillment of what the prophets foretold. And so he will provide, he will provide, he will provide. He did provide a substitutionary sacrifice. There's no plan B. So before we get into to, to Passover, I want to I wanna lay a foundation here. We've got a table here that we've got all this stuff sitting on, okay? And this table is a foundation. We've got books, cups, candles, all kinds of stuff, pamphlets, haggadahs, shofars. And so I want to lay some foundation. You need to understand the biblical calendar. The Lord has a calendar, and then we have um, a calendar that we operate on. And I brought some calendars for everybody who came here tonight as a gift from me to you. Um, and you guys can take these home. But it's going to show you where the biblical holidays are um, on the calendar. Um, and it's going to show you how Messiah is pictured in each one of these. Okay, um, And it's going to show you a lot more than that. But the point of it is, is to show you that everything prophetically is based upon God's reckoning of time, which was re revealed to Moses at Mount Sinai. And so the first unit of time that we need to talk about is the day. Genesis 1.5, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And so in the Hebrew mind, um, the, the beginning of the day begins at sunset. Our reckoning of time, sunset, isn't the beginning of the, of the new day. It's midnight. Um, and that's really key to interpretation of, of, of Scripture. Um, but I want to lay that foundational unit of time um, but they think about time completely different in, in the Eastern world than we do. Um, with the Chinese people um, that I was with all the way into the Middle East, um, they think of time cyclically. Um, we think of time in linear. And what I mean by that is, is we've got Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, start a new line. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, start a new line, linear. But the Hebrew mind and the Eastern mind thinks of time completely different. It's cyclical. It's the, it's, the way I explain it to my kids is if you've got a, it's like a spring. You've got a, a big spring. You've got these coils that continuously um, make this circle in the same path. It never touches the same place once because it's, it's a continuous cycle. That's what that spring is. And that's, that's how the, the, the Hebrew mind thinks about time. And so this is actually a representation of a calendar from the Eastern mindset and from the Hebrew mindset. And tied in here are all these agricultural things that are all prophetic indicators. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But um, I think that John even speaks to this in the Revelation when he says, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. We're in this constant cycles of being renewed. God's making all things new. And Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so the Hebrew mind, when they hear that, they're thinking of the prophetic calendar. They're not just thinking of being transformed. It's not just a random statement. That, that connects to calendar in the Hebrew mind. So are we on the right calendar? Well, there's a number of different calendars in the world. Um, but the, the three majors are um, the lunar calendar, which is the, what the Islamic world uses. It's dedicated to the Arabian moon god, which is Allah which was actually a form of Baal worship. Um, it was their version of Baal worship, and then it became Islam. Uh, it got rebranded. Um, and that's why on the top of um, mosques, you'll see this crescent moon, because that's their god. Um, and their, their calendar, um, the lunar year is 354 days, and so their calendar radically, and they don't have a leap year, so it radically revolves against ours. It's constantly revolving against ours. Then we have the calendar that we use in the rest of the world, the solar, the Julian or Gregorian calendar, which is dedicated to the Roman sun god, Sol Invictus, and it's purely a solar calendar, 365, 366 in a leap year. Then you have the Hebrew calendar um, dedicated and, uh, and brought to us by the God of the, of the Bible. Um, and, uh, and it's a lunar solar calendar, and it's tied to both. And so they also have a leap year, and when they have a leap year, they have a 13th month. And so um, whenever you see the beginning of the first little sliver of the moon on this side, that's the beginning of a Hebrew month, the new moon, Rosh Hodesh. And so the, the thing I want to footstop is, is everything 
in prophecy in the scripture is tied to this calendar. And so we want to understand this, both as it relates to Yeshua's first and second coming. So let's talk about the feasts. Before we get into um, uh, Passover, we need to understand the foundation of what is Passover. Passover is one of really eight appointments. In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 through 44, the Lord gives um, seven seasonal and one weekly prophetic appointment. The word in there, Moedim, or Moed, singular, Moedim, plural, um, these are appointments. It's as if God came to you and he said, I want to meet with you here, 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 and here. Mark it on your calendar. Now, you could call that a holiday, but really it's an appointment because God said, I'm going to meet with you. If your boss says, I want to meet with you, you don't call it a holiday, right? You, you, you call it a meeting. And so the Hebrew word here is appointment. It's a meeting. Um, and it's a prophetic appointment that ties to God's overall plan of restoration that began in the garden. No plan B, just a plan A. Um, and so he gives the Sabbath. He gives the Passover. He gives the unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles in English. Um, or Pesach, Hag Hamatzah, Habikarim, Shavuot, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. Um, and so we understand that Yeshua's death is tied to Passover. Um, Yeshua died as the Passover lamb and fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Um, but there's so much more here. Um, the next prophetic appointment begins the very next day, Hag Hamatzah. For seven days, we're in the middle of Hag Hamatzah. Um, from Passover, um, counting Passover, plus the seven days of Hag Hamatzah, eight days we eat unleavened bread. Well, before we get into Passover week, we have a, a thing where we where we go through our house called Betachat Chametz, the removal of leaven. What is leaven a symbol of? Sin. All right? And so this is unleavened bread. But before, and spring cleaning comes from this. Um, there's a lot of things that we do today come, come from the practices of the Bible, like boxer shorts. Um, the high, God invented that for the high priest. Um, just so you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, covers. You know, there's 50,000 words in English that have a, a they come directly entomologically from Hebrew. And covers is one of them. And it comes from kippa, a covering. Um, and uh, so when you pull your covers up, it's a prophetic incense, a prophetic act, because it's rooted in the covering. And this is rooted in that prophetic covering that God poured out on Yom Kippur. We're going to talk about that. But we do this, this thing, Berakat Hametz. We go through the house, we take a candle, a spoon, um, a cloth, a feather, and we go through and we search for leaven. After the mamas have gone through the house and uh, de-leavenized it um, to the best of their ability, you're going to go through and you're going to search for it. And any that we find, we take it out. And all of these implements have a prophetic picture. The feather, the Holy Spirit, the, wo the wood, the, the spoon, the cross, the candle, the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it's the word of God that brings light to the darkness inside of us. Um, all of these and every part of it has a prophetic, a prophetic application. Um, but the thing is, is um, no matter how hard we try, we've been doing this since my 30, 31st Passover this year. Um, a couple years ago, we had a girl staying with us from Arkansas, and she was going to school. And, um, and my sons, would ra she, she had her own snacks, and she learned pretty quick that if she left them out, my sons would eat them. And so she decided she found this cabinet that we would store chairs in. Well, there were no chairs in there, so she stuffed all of her cakes and ho-hos and ding-dongs and all that stuff, that whatever they were called, in there. And so I did my whole Betacot Hamets go through the whole house. And then about five days into Passover week, I realized, oh, my gosh, I opened this up looking for chairs, and there's Levin City in there. And, and the thing of it is, is we could do our best, but ultimately we need somebody to remove the Levin. And did you know when Yeshua drove out the tax um, or the money changers from the temple and flipped the temple tables over? Betacot Hamets. He was going through cleaning, cleaning house. No, he didn't. No, no, he didn't. He used a whip. So maybe we need to bring a whip into our Passover. Get that leaven out. Um, all right. Anyway, uh, but unleavened bread. And so Yeshua, this is a picture of Yeshua's body in the grave and the removal of sin from the world. Um, and, uh, and then he resurrects first fruits. And first fruits, he's a, this is a prophetic picture 
of, of the first fruits of the resurrection. We bring the Aviv barley before the Lord in the temple. We wave it before the Lord. And not only did Yeshua, but others resurrected with him. And Acts tells us that there were 500 witnesses to the fact that Yeshua and other people got up out of the grave. Um, and that's a former. There's a prophetic pattern of formers and ladders. And the formers are great, but the, the ladders are always greater. And then 50 days later comes Shavuot. Now, the book of Acts was not the first Shavuot or Pentecost. Um, the first Shavuot or Pentecost happens at Mount Sinai. It's in the third month. Because if the first of Nisan, two weeks before Passover, is the beginning of the new year, um, and you've got this whole week, and then 50 days later, you've got Shavuot. You're into the third month of the year. Well, what happens in the third month of the year? They're at Mount Sinai, and Moses is up on the mountain. Exodus chapter 32, he comes down with the first set of Ten Commandments. Um, and what are the children of Israel doing? Worshiping the golden calf. Well, what does he do? He breaks the Ten Commandments, right? Then he destroys the, um, the golden calf. He tells the Levites to strap on their swords and go through the camp and kill. Exodus 32. And how many die? About 3,000. First Shavuot, the Word of God comes down on stone. 1,500 years later, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, comes down upon um, the Talmudim, the, the disciples of Yeshua, gathered in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit comes down in tongues of fire. And there was fire on the mountain when Moses was up there, but tongues of fire come down and on the hearts of the disciple, and the Word of God is emblazoned, the Torah is emblazoned onto the hearts of the Talmudim, the disciples of Yeshua, and they go out in the power of the Holy Spirit, and how many get saved? About 3,000. God is working on his prophetic calendar then the prophetic calendar goes quiet for the summer i call this the church age i might be wrong i might be right but this is just what i call it and this is the age where the 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 basura the good news is going out to all the nations um and this is what do you do in in the summer you go out in your garden you come home from work and you're pulling maters off your mater plant and zucchini squash and corn if you can grow it um i've never been able to grow corn anyway uh but then the fall comes and it's the picture of the final harvest Okay, and uh, and then the prophetic calendar picks back up again, and it picks up with trumpets, Yom Teruah. Today we, they call it Rosh Hashanah, but it's not called that in the in the in the scriptures. It's called Yom Teruah, the day of trumpeting. And in a synagogue service, we'll blast the trumpet a hundred times, and um, and then uh, um, ten days later comes Yom uh, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And the ten days between this is called Yomim Noraim, the days of all. And then five days after Yom Kippur comes Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, this is a picture of Yeshua's return. What, what heralds his return? A trumpet blast and the shout um, when he comes back. And what's the, the prophetic calendar picked back up with? Trumpets. Then ten days later, um, the Day of Atonement. It's a prophetic picture of the Atonement of Israel, um, Zechariah and Romans uh, and Joel, um, and the Judgment of the Nations. Um, that are gathered against Israel. And then five days later, Sukkot, which is the, the wedding supper of the Lamb. It's a prophetic picture of the wedding supper of the Lamb. And the Hebrew wedding is patterned after this. In fact, the Hebrew wedding was a two-phased event. It begins with Passover. We have a cup of wine that Yeshua drinks during the Passover Seder meal. And he holds it up and he says, I'm not going to have this cup with you again till my kingdom comes. Okay? Well, in the Hebrew context, how weddings went where let's let's pretend that you know you're in um Capernaum um first century Israel and you fancy this young maiden over here okay and you're Mordecai okay and uh and uh and this is Joey Banami behind you which is is your dad and uh, you say um dad I want to I want to marry this this fair maiden and so you guys go together to her father and you, you broke her covenant. And, and today this covenant is still practiced. We write a ketubah, a contract. And they seal it with a drink. Now, f in first century Israel, what they would do is at that point they were considered married. And the groom would go home and add on to his father's house and insula. In fact, if you go to around the Galilee, you can see some crazy add-ons and additions. And they were going to he was going to prepare a suitable habitation for his bride. And it wasn't until the father of the groom said, you've made a suitable habitation for your bride, go get her. Hey, you need to put a little more hay in that mattress. Um, she's going to want a bigger kitchen. Um, uh, but it, it wasn't until the father said, you've made a suitable habitation for your bride, that the second phase of the wedding would take place. And when he said, you've made a suitable habitation, then he was released to go get his bride, and they would have that second cup of wine. 
feast, the tabernacles, the Hebrew weddings patterned after this. And so the disciples understood that Yeshua is speaking, wedding speak, in the context of his prophetic appointments. And we're going to go deep into Passover tonight. But you need to understand what Passover is. Passover is number one of seven prophetic appointments. And it's not just these seasonal, and it's not just the weekly, the Shabbat, but the Lord actually has prophetic appointments all through the Word. Um, um, in, in the book of Acts, you see God moving at um, 9 in the morning, noon, um, and at 3 o'clock. Well, why? Because this is the time of the, the, the offerings in the temple, but it was the appointed hour of prayer. Um, and it's, it's even referenced that way. Um, a couple places in the New Testament, the appointed hour of prayer. Well, this was the, the time of the, um, the morning, afternoon, and evening offering was an appointed time, an appointment daily. Then you had the weekly, the Shabbat. Then you had the monthly, Rosh Hodesh, the new moon. Um, then you had the seasonal, which are right here before you. Then in every gener- or every decade, you had one, the Shemitah year, the Sabbath of the land. Every seven years, we rest the land. And then in every generation, we have the Yuval, the Jubilee. So really, there's a message here in these prophetic appointments that he individually and prophetically, individually, he wants you from sun up to sundown. He wants your day. The Shabbat, he wants your week. Rosh Hodesh, he wants your month. The, the, the seasonal feast, he wants your year. The Shemitah, he wants your decade. The Yuval, the Jubilee, he wants your generation. He wants every moment of your life. And there's a prophetic appointment for every moment of your life. These are prophetic appointments. All right. So here's another way to look at it. So this is a menorah. Everybody's familiar with a menorah. There's even a plant in Israel that this is patterned after. Um, and uh, seven branches on a regular menorah. So you've got the first candle lit, Passover, Yeshua on the cross, unleavened bread, Benakat Hametz, the removal of sin, first fruits, the first fruits of the resurrection. Um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God emblazoned on the hearts of men, Shavuot or Pentecost, trumpets, Yeshua's return, atonement, the judgment of nations and the national atonement of Israel, and tabernacles, the wedding supper of the Lamb. When all of God's prophetic appointments are fulfilled in their totality and completion, it's a picture of the fullness of light, all the branches of the menorah lit. And what does it tell us when Yeshua comes back for His millennial reign? We're going to have no need of the sun because he's going to light up the world. The prophetic fullness of light when he is reigning here from Jerusalem. And I want to foot stomp the fact that where he went up, Mount of Olives, he's going to come back down. And he's going to go right back in the eastern gate, which the Muslims blocked up with um, stones. Like that's going to work. Okay? Um, and actually, that's a statement of faith. If he wasn't Messiah, why even bother blocking it up? Really? You know? Um. And so here's another way to look at it. Spring feast, his first coming. Um, uh, Church age outpouring of the Holy Spirit summer. Fall feast, his second coming. Now, he did in part fulfill these um, fall feasts. And I I want to give you an example here. We have a play set here for Elijah. This is Elijah's place right here at the table. Every year at Passover, we set a place for Elijah. Um, Now, we understand from the the Scripture that... um, John the Baptist, Yeshua says, you know, if you will accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. We know that John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, right? Um, We know that he's six months older than Jesus, Yeshua. Um, We also know from the scripture that John the Baptist, the Elijah who was to come, um, his father, Zechariah, was a Kohen, a priest. And we know that when he was in there burning incense on the altar, which for him he cast lots, and he won the lot to go and do it because for a regular piece, it was a once-in-a-lifetime event for them to do that. The Kohen Haggadol, the high priest, he could go in and burn incense anytime he wanted to um, when it was the appropriate time to do it. But for a regular priest, he only got to do it one time in his life. So this one-time-in-a-life event, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, is in the temple burning incense on the incense altar, and he has this encounter. He's told he's going to have a son, John the Baptist. Um, and it turns out he is the Elijah who was to come. Well, they give us a little clue in there that um, Zechariah was a priest in the course of Abiah. We know from the historical record there there were 24 courses of priests. Abiah was one of them. And they served two-week stints in the temple. So if during their normal um, temple service window, if that was point of conception, then that puts John the Baptist being born when? Passover. When we expected 
that's when we set a place for Elijah. The kids get up. They go open the door to see if Elijah's there. And if he's six months older than Yeshua, then that puts Yeshua being born during Feast of Tabernacles. Christ tabernacled among us. So God's moving on his prophetic calendar. So this is the, I want to lay that foundation for you because we can talk about Passover, but if you don't understand it in its native origin context, Leviticus 23, which Leviticus 23 is like the keys to prophecy. Everybody wants to try to understand prophecy without understanding this. But you've got to have the keys if you want to open that door properly. I mean, you can, you can push your way in. But when you have Levit- Leviticus 23 and you understand these prophetic appointments, it's the keys to prophecy. And it's the key to understanding the prophetic properly. So let's talk about Passover. Leviticus 23.5, the Lord tells us it's the 14th of Nisan. Like I said before, this is the first month of the year. Two weeks into the new year, um, this is the biblical new year. Now today we have a biblical new year and a civil new year. But in Israel, we celebrate the civil new year not the biblical new year. Um, And we have a special meal to remember, to look back. But in a sense, it's not just to look back. It's also a rehearsal dinner for the wedding supper of the Lamb. So this isn't just a looking back. This is also a looking forward to this great moment to stay when Yeshua comes back for his bride. Because what did he say? Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many rooms or many mansions. The accurate translation is rooms. He's talking bridal speak. He takes that drink. I'm not going to have it again with you till kingdom comes. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many rooms. He's making a suitable habitation for his bride. And when he comes back, is the second face of that Hebrew wedding. And so this is not only a looking back, but this is a looking forward. It's not just a looking back to the exodus from Egypt, but it's also a looking back to what Yeshua did, and it's a looking forward to what he's going to do. He's coming back for his bride. So we had this special meal, and during the meal, we have a number of things here. Um, We have this bread. We have this matzah. um, And in order for matzah to be kosher for Passover, it's not just unleavened. uh, but according to the sages and the rabbis, um, it's got to meet um, three additional specifications. Um, it's got to be striped, bruised, and pierced. And we know from the scripture that he was um, bruised for our iniquities. He was pierced for our transgressions. Um, by his stripes, we are healed. And we have this other thing called the afikomen. Um, or matzatash, but we'll show you the afikomen here in a second. And so, and many actually believe that it was, you know, if you read in Acts, there, were, there weren't just a handful of Jewish people that were believers. There were thousands. Many Pharisees were, 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 were believers. Many parashim. Um, and, uh, and for the first, probably uh, at least a century of the, of the church, uh, you know, what we call the church today, um, was was not just a majority Jewish, but was heavily influenced. Um, that began to shift, especially in the in the late two hundreds. Um, but we the, a lot of a lot of people think that maybe the early messianics brought this this part into the seder. We don't know, but I want to show you what we do. So we take out the middle matzah. There's three par- compartments in here. We have the f- um, three matzahs in here, and we take out the middle matzah, and we break it during the seder meal. And we wrap it in this cloth. And when we wrap it in this white cloth, this, um, this white linen cloth, we go and hide it, um, and we bury it. And it, afikomen means the coming one. Um, and it's not actually a native Hebrew word. Um, and it's a part of the Seder meal. But during the Seder meal, we, we wrap this up. And there's all kinds of explanations by the rabbis. What does this mean? What does this mean? But to me, it's a prophetic picture of Yeshua. Um, we've got... The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all three parts of, of God here represented. And the middle one is broken, which is a picture of Yeshua. And then part of it's wrapped in this white linen cloth. And then at a certain point in the meal, the kids look for it. And then it's ransomed back by the Father. And when it's ransomed back by the Father of the, at, the, at the meal, it's reunited with the middle part. And so this is a prophetic picture of Yeshua. Um, we have a number of other elements on, on the plate. We've got the, the, the lamb shank bone. 
Now today, Jewish people don't traditionally eat lamb for Passover. They eat chicken because there's no temple. Um, but that, for the first time in 2,000 years, may actually, may actually shift. And to me, that's very, very, very prophetic. Because we know that um, uh, the Beit HaMikdash is going to be rebuilt, the, the, the house of the Lord, the, the temple in Jerusalem. We know from the prophetic scriptures it's going to be rebuilt. We know that there's going to be a battle, that there's this guy, Anti-Messiah, the Antichrist, who's going to come in and proclaim that he is God, operating in the prophetic pattern of Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes, which it plays out in the whole Hanukkah story. Antiochus was a Greek. Um, he, uh, he comes in during, in, um, during the Hanukkah story, um, and uh, he sets up a, a, a statue of Zeus with his face on it. Basically, he's saying he's Zeus incarnate. The Antiochus Epiphanes means, uh, you know, that he's he's saying that I'm God in the, in, in the flesh, and so um, and he sacrifices a pig on the altar in the temple, which was an abomination because um, it was an unclean animal, and so and then not only that, he puts the cart, uh, the statue on a cart, and has it go to every village in Israel and demands that everybody worship him as God. Well, there's an uprising by priests led by priests. Um, uh, the Maccabees, and they defeat him, and um, and uh, and then the temple's restored. And so there's going to be an anti messiah that's going to come, that where where all systems go for a third temple. I could show you picture after picture: the altars built, the clothes are made, um, all the implements. And interestingly enough, um, Kyle Rickman, he had he did an interview with the the Telegraph of London. This has been two years ago, um, and it was interesting. I don't know what exactly he meant by it, but the guy in the, in the London Telegraph, which is a major paper in London, they asked him, do you guys have the Ark of the Covenant? And he said, we do. It's one kilometer from where we're doing this interview. So by reading what he said in that, in that article, that to me was an indication that at least they know where it is. I don't know. Um, I took that as a, a, a pretty powerful statement. It went largely unnoticed, but to me it had huge prophetic uh, consequences. But let's get back to Passover. So we have this special meal. We have four cups of wine. And it's this third cup um, that I want to highlight, the cup of redemption that he holds up and he said, this is my blood. And so what we, what we have here, what we call communion today, may I lift this up? Okay. What we call communion today with the, with the grape juice in, 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 the, in the unleavened bread um, <coughs> is directly from this meal that was celebrated from the exodus of Egypt all the way up to present day. And so and it's this third cup of wine of four, the cup of redemption that Yeshua holds up and he said, this is my blood shed for you. And then we have this book called the Haggadah, the telling. There's a couple different ones up here. This is the one I've used for a, a lot of years, the Messianic Passover Haggadah. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, but um, Miss Ann gave me a copy of this one by First Fruits of Zion, which is a, a Messianic ministry um, in Israel. And uh, this is actually a pretty cool Haggadah. I think we might give this one a go next year. Um, but it takes you through through the whole Passover story in about an hour's time. And we go through all the key parts. We go through the bitter herbs. We go through the matzah, the, the different cups of wine and what, what, they, what they represent. But the thing that I want to point out to you tonight, um, not just the elements of the Seder meal themselves, which you would see in a lot of traditional Messiah and the Passover Seder, the thing I want you to understand is that this is, this is the Lord's prophetic calendar that he is working on. Um, and, and it's tied to Yeshua's first coming and second coming. And it's tied to what I really call the bridal anointing. Because he's speaking bridal speak as he holds up that, um, that second cup of wine and, and he makes that statement to his disciples that I'm not going to have this again um, till my, my, you know, my father's kingdom comes. You know, he's speaking bridal speak and his disciples understood that. So let's, um, let's look at a couple more things here. Um, number one, there's this famous saying, a picture's worth a thousand words. So we have this famous picture of the Last Supper with the nice white tablecloth. Um, they're all sitting on really cool chairs. They're all surrounding them with these awesome robes um, that are, you know, gold, very Roman. Um, and, uh, um, and he's got this huge loaf of Panera bread. Um, 
And uh, now that's a picture. And you know, when he when he painted this, he was doing the best he had with what he had to do. But is that an accurate picture of what Passover looked like and what it was? It, it creates an image in our mind when we think of the Last Supper. But no, this is what Passover looked like: sitting on the floor, reclining on pillows. We didn't sit on chairs; we sat on the floor. And we're not eating Panera bread; we're eating matzah, which is a picture of Yeshua. Um, not this humongous Panera bread. And so, why does that ma- matter? Well, number one, you know, when we understand things properly, um, it's not changing anything doctrinally here. But it, it is a revelation. For instance, before this whole Passover drama plays out, Yeshua's in the, Ghana, or, um, the Garden um, uh, of Gethsemane. Um, and uh, he's praying out, out there and... Uh, as he's praying, the disciples are falling asleep, and it says blood and sweat start to pour out. Now I've heard all kinds of crazy explanations about, you know, even doctors, you know, say, citing historical things where people started sweating blood. Now I don't know anybody who sweated blood, and I've never heard of anybody. Maybe it's happened, but um, but what the what the Hebrew mind grabs something, especially when you're reading it in its native context, um, and you're reading it from a Hebraic mind. And let me give you an example of this. In, in, in the time of Yeshua, the Garden of Gethsemane is olive trees. And there's really old olive trees there today. And they, and they processed olives there. And there's two things they did with olives. They run a millstone over it. And then they would take a huge, enormous, crushing stone, this big vertical stone, and they would bring this big vertical stone down to bear on olive, down, olives down here in this little basin and completely and utterly smash, crush the olives. And you would get the best press of oil from that. That giant crushing stone is a Gethsemane. And so the Hebrew mind, the image that comes to the Hebrew mind is here's Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Gethsemane of the world's sin, the crushing weight of the world's sin, is coming down on Yeshua, and the blood is coming out. That doesn't change anything doctrinally, but I want, what I'm trying to show you is when you begin to look at the Bible through Hebrew glasses, you begin to, the Bible comes alive in a way that you never understood before. You, you tracking with me? Making sense? Not sounding crazy? All right. Okay. So um, the other thing I want to point out is they're sitting, reclining as free men, because free men sat reclining. Um, slaves did not eat this way, but free men did. And they're eating the unleavened bread. And, and the, the reality is, they were not just free men, but the reality change when you think about Passover in the context of us as believers. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, you guys got 10 more minutes in you? Okay, all right. All right, so 15? Okay, all right. You give me 15, I'll take it. So, um, the, Okay. Prob- problem is getting me to shut up, all right? So... Uh, so let, but the thing I want to I want to point out to you is is, is um, uh, I forget what I was saying now before I asked. Freeman, they'll come back to me. Oh yeah, so they weren't just free men, um, but the, there's a change here that's that you when you understand it from the Hebraic mindset. And when I talk to my fellow Jewish people about this, it freaks them out because when they think about. God, they think about God and approaching God completely different. You know, for instance, the only time that somebody could go into the presence of God was during Yom Kippur, the sixth prophetic appointment on that calendar from Leviticus 23. One time of the year, the Kohen Haggadol could go into the Kodesh for Kodeshim before the, the Ark of the Covenant and make atonement for the people. And it was a huge all-day event, multiple baths, you know, um, and he didn't wear his normal high priestly garments. He wore just plain white, regular priestly garments. And he would go in there after this elaborate ceremony. And it was just him, one person for the whole nation, one time a year. But Hebrews tells us that now we can go boldly before the throne. This is a huge reality change. Now, it doesn't mean cavalier. But what it does mean is, number one, we're free. But we're not just free. We're sons and daughters now. Okay. This is the reality that we operate in as believers, that we can go boldly before, before the throne and that we can actually literally call him Abba. Um, that's, that's really a foreign thing um, 
and it's that's it's a huge privilege that we operate under and not to be and the, the 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 problem with that is is we we forget the holiness of god um whereas there's a a real understanding of the holiness and the awesomeness of god i think within uh, especially with orthodox judaism there's a lot of baggage there but there's also a real revelation of the holiness of god and uh after Passover, we have Hag Hamatzah. Um, and this comes to us from Leviticus 20, um, 23 6. It's the 15th of Nisan. It's a high Shabbat. The thing I want to point out to you is Shabbat, or uh, Passover week, we have two Shabbats. And a lot of theologians mess up the timeline because they don't understand that there's actually two Sabbaths during Passover week. Unleavened bread is a Sabbath. It's a high Sabbath, but it's a Sabbath. And Jewish people just simply refer to it as a Shabbat. And so people don't, don't understand the fact that there's two Shabbats. And when you start reading this whole, what you would call the Passion Week, um, with the revelation of there's two Sabbaths now, um, that's, that, that really affects how people read that and, and interpret that. Um, because the one thing that you have to understand is the whole concept in the church, and I don't want to offend or hurt anybody or tip over anybody's sacred cows here, but, you know, the Good Friday... This Sunday morning, three days, three nights. That's not three days, three nights, okay? And so, I'm not trying to, not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but, but, but we un, we should understand it in it what what it really looked like. And when we get that, there's more revelation there for us. Um, and and like I said, we the whole ceremony of Beta Hamet's the removal of leaven, and there's it's a prophetic picture of we can't do it. He had to do it for us. Um, and in the first fruits of the barley harvest. Um, we would bring it in, uh, Leviticus uh, 2311. Um, it's a holy convocation. There's three holy convocations, three times a year, where all of Israel would present themselves, or all the Israeli men would present themselves before the Lord. Um, and then in a Shemitah year, um, on Feast of Tabernacles, um, the entire nation, men, women, and children, would have to present themselves. So once a year, every seventh year, during the seventh and final feast, all of Israel would have to present themselves before the Lord because um, the king would bring the word. He would read the entire Torah to the whole gathered nation. He would re- read the entire thing to them. And then they would get the high priestly barthing. And it's a prophetic picture of the king and the priest, Yeshua, who was both king and priest, bringing the word and the blessing to his people. But this is a holy convocation where all the men would come. And typically their, their children and, and their wives would come along too, but they weren't required to. And they present themselves before the Lord in the temple. And so you've got this, you've got Shavuot, Pentecost, um, and that's why all these people were gathered in, in Jerusalem during Shavuot. These were Jews from all around the nations, the diaspora that were scattered, coming back to celebrate this holy convocation and the Feast of Tabernacles, the seventh and final feast. Um, and... Uh, and the interesting thing about Shavuot, um, the four spring feast, is it's got three different names. Hag, Hag, Shavuot. And here's the references. Yom, Habikarim, Day of First Fruits, because it's also a first fruits. The first first fruits is the first fruits of the barley harvest. The second first fruits is the first fruits of the wheat harvest, um, because now they're, they're getting the first fruits of the wheat is coming in. Um, and that's another prophetic picture. So the first first fruits is the prophetic picture of. Um, the resurrection. The second first fruits is a, pr- a prophetic picture of um, the first fruits of all the nations coming in, and then Hag Hakatzir, the feast of harvest. Um, and so, um, and like I said earlier, you know, uh, Mount uh, in on the mountain, Mount in in, in Sinai, uh, uh, they uh, they're out there, and. Uh, Moses is up there on the mountain, and God's given him the revelation, and then he comes down. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about um, Shavuot in the context of all of these um, spring feasts is that we read the book of Ezekiel with a whirlwind coming um, of the north, the great marching wind. We also read Ezekiel 36. We read about the fleshy heart and the stony hearts. And in, in Shavuot, it's a picture of a heart transplant, the Word of God being emblazoned on our hearts. And, and then we read it um, uh, out of Exodus, too. All right. We stay up all night. 
We read Ezekiel 36, 26, I'll give you a new heart and put in you a new spirit within you. And I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart, uh, give you a heart of flesh. Um, and then 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22. Now it's God who makes both us stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set the seal of ownership on us. He put a spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. It was a pilgrimage feast. And I want to jump. Here we go. But we also read the book of Ruth. And this ties into the prophetic season we're in. The 70th anniversary of Israel. What I talked to you at the beginning about Zechariah 8.23. Ten men from every nation coming and grabbing hold of the Jew by the corner of his garment. In fact, whenever you read the corner of the garment, you should take notice. Um, when the woman with the issue of blood grabbed the hold of the corner of Jesus' garment, she was grabbing his seat seat. This is hanging on the corner of our garment. Our outer garment, our talit, has these, these strings, seat seat, or seat seat. And, um, and the reason she grabbed it is she knew that he was Messiah. And the promise of the scripture was that the Son of Man would arise with healing in his wings. Well, the corner of our garment is called the kanafim, the wings. Jesus didn't walk around with wings on his back. Um, we know that. Um, what's that talking about? The Son of Man would arise with healing in his wings. Well, the wings, the kind of theme of his garment, she understood that if he was Messiah, there was healing in the wings, and she grabbed a hold right here of this. And um, and when King David was fleeing um, from from King Saul um, before he was king, uh, and Saul was trying to kill him, he found Saul sleeping in a cave, and he cut off the corner of his garments. When Jewish people die, we cut off the kind of theme of, of our garments before we're buried, and, uh, and we cut off the seat seat. And, uh, and so, um, and, and even when the woman with the issue of blood um, grabbed hold of Yeshua's garment, what did Yeshua do immediately after that? He went to the synagogue ruler's house, whose daughter had already died, Tabitha, and he takes off his garment and lays it on her. And he re resurrects her after he lays his garment on her. The Son of Man will arise with healing in his wings. You should just do a study on this alone. It'll blow your mind. Um, I don't have time to teach about that tonight. But what I'm trying to do is tie in Zechariah 8.23 to why we read the book of Ruth during Shavuot and how it ties into the prophetic appointments and prophetically how it ties into this great restoration of Israel and God's prophetic calendar. And so we read the book of Ruth. We stay up all night. Um, and uh, the barley harvest is waning down. The wheat harvest, we're getting the first fruits. And so it's set during this time of harvest. And, uh, and Ruth, we know, was a Moabitist, and, um, and she chooses to go with her mother-in-law, Naomi, after her husband dies, um, and join herself with Naomi, with her God, um, and with her people in, in the land of Israel. Um, and we, we read on about how Boaz ends up being her kinsman, redeemer, and then she ends up being the line of Yeshua. Um, well, the thing about this is, is, you know, Ruth devotes herself to the God of Israel, to his word, um, and Shavuot is the celebration of the giving of the word. We, we celebrate the giving of the Torah during Shavuot, and she connects herself. Um, this takes place at Beit Lechem, the house of bread, where Yeshua is going to um, be born and where um, the line of Messiah comes through. And, um, uh, and Ruth comes to Boaz during the night, and she lays at his feet um, at the end of the bar barley harvest, and she says, spread the corner of your garment over me, for you have the right of redemption over me. Here's that corner of the garment again, the bridal anointing. This bridal anointing tied into the prophetic plan of God in the feasts. And Orpah, um, her other sister-in-law, you know, she didn't go with Ruth and Naomi back to the land. She said, I love you, Naomi. I love you, Naomi. But she, she turns and goes back to Moab. And Orpah means in Hebrew to turn the back of the neck. But Ruth means a friend with vision in Hebrew. And Ruth joins herself to the people of Israel. Um, and then she's um, allowed to glean from the corners of the field, but then she's invited to glean not just from the corners, which was allowed by Torah, but now she's um, given a double portion from uh, from the center of the field. And this is a picture of the blessing of those who bless Israel in the last days and the double portion, I believe, that will flow. So, Passover, this covenant meal, 
that we celebrate, which has become the Lord's Supper in churches today, with these four different cups of wine, the cup of redemption, the um, cup of blessing, the cup of plagues, All of these elements, the bitter herbs to remind us of the bitterness of slavery, the bitterness of bondage that we were once in, but now we're not in it because we're free. And greater than that, now we're sons and daughters. It's a prophetic appointment of God. It's not just a holiday. And in one sense, we're looking back at what was done in Egypt, at the cross. But from the context of the bridal anointing, I'm not going to have this cup again with you till my kingdom comes. It's the second phase of the Jewish wedding that we're looking for. And it's an allusion to follow this prophetic calendar to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Two feast of tabernacles. It's a wedding dinner rehearsal. Today we have a wedding rehearsal dinner before the wedding. And so what I want to put before you is in large sense in the church today, there's this belief that, oh, you know, that's old. We don't we don't need this anymore. It's done. It's done. But when you go through this and you understand the fullness of it and that God is still working on this calendar today. In fact, if you watch Israel and you look at key events unfolding like, like that, um, the, the Israeli jets over Iran, the, all of these Muslims trying to storm across the Gaza border and this monumental sacrifice being taken place. Well, it's not, just, it's not just happening on any random day. It's happening on a prophetic appointment. And if you watch events with Israel, and you start watching the biblical calendar, you're going to see God is still working on this calendar. He's saying something to you. And so it's a part of your inheritance, but greater than that, he's still working on this. And he's not done with Israel. He's coming back. Prophetic indicator, Jerusalem Post, front page. Um, I think three months ago now. You can still read the article online if you pull it up. One in five Jewish millennials now believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. One in five. You can't say that about millennials in the United States. If you did a survey of millennials here in the United States, you'd probably, you'd be lucky if you got one in one, or one in, you know, I mean, I don't, you know, you know what I mean. But the point is, is that's a monumental prophetic marker. Now, my people... When they come to know Messiah, I want to footstep something. We're still Jewish. Okay? You know. Um, and, um, and so, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but, you know, if you want to talk to us about Messiah, don't try to make us a Baptist. Not, I got saved in the Baptist church. I'm not, I'm not Baptist bashing. But what, I, what, what I'm p- trying to point out is this great restoration of Israel is a huge special thing. And it's not just that we have something for Israel, the Besor, the good news, the Messiah. But Israel has something for us, a revelation of the roots and the foundations of the faith, this inheritance that we're largely ignorant of in the church. I hope that makes some kind of sense to you. And, yes. And, 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 yeah. and so what Paul is talking about, you know, in Romans is the one new man. There's no longer a middle wall of partition. There was a soreg, a 13-gate fence around the temple complex. No Gentile could go past that to worship God. And then after that, there was a court where women could only go. And then after that, there was only a place where you know, Levites could go so far. And then priests. And then one place where the high priest could only go one time a year. And in a sense, there's, a, there's an access to God that all of us have. Um, and, you know, there's no longer male or female. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. There's one new man. Well, there's clearly still male and female. There's clearly still Jew and Gentile. But as far as access to God, we, we're one new man. But we all still have a role. And so what I want to lay before you tonight is partake of this. It's a part of your inheritance. Um, it's a blessing. It's a revelation. Get an understanding of the prophetic calendar. And... So my gift to you, if I may, Pastor, get, so a calendar to everybody tonight. Um, uh, yeah, here, if you want to just make sure everybody gets, gets a calendar tonight. Um, and um, before I wrap up tonight, I know this is probably the most unorthodox uh, Christ in the Passover, Messiah in the Passover. Um, I do it a little bit different. Um, 
Um, but I want you to understand the fullness of it. And so um, I hope it was a blessing that for you that you came out tonight. I hope there was some revelation here for you tonight. But I, before we go tonight, I would like to recite the ironic blessing over you. And this, the thing about this is, is it's not a religious act. It's a prophetic act. Because the, there's a promise that comes with it. It says, when it's recited, that it would be placing his name upon his people. And I believe that when you place his name upon his people, that something happens. Um, and so I believe that it is very much a prophetic act. And that he is downloading things to you. That he has things available for you. This is just a snippet. I mean, we could talk about this for, you know, 30 weeks in a, in a Bible study. We could go deep into every little item. But in, a, in the context of an hour, hour and 20 minutes, you know, there's only so much we can do. And so I hope this was a blessing for you. And I want to recite this blessing over you now. I'm going to hold my hands like this, and I'm not trying to be weird. Um, but this represents the Hebrew letter Sheen, which is the first letter in the title of God. Not, it's not a name, it's a title, Shaddai, El Shaddai. And uh, if you ever saw Leonard Nimoy from Star Trek, Spock, he held his hand like this. Leonard Nimoy was Jewish. And he was actually imparting a covertly high priestly blessing over his audience when he said, live long and prosper. And so, uh, yeah, and, and the three valleys of Jerusalem come together and form a Sheen. Um, every door is marked with a, a, a thing called a mezuzah, and at the top there's a, a sheen. And uh, even the chambers of our heart are cut away, the side, way, uh, side cut away of our heart. You can see the Hebrew letter sheen, where we have the mark of our maker. And so we're placing his name upon you. That's why I'm holding my hands this way. Isadonai panavilecha veasem laka shalom. And this means the Lord will, not may. The Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will, not may, cause his face to shine upon you. That's a really big deal, the fact that the face of the living God would shine upon you. And that he lift up his countenance upon you to give you shalom, which isn't just peace, the absence of conflict, but it's completeness and wholeness in every area. So may he make you complete and whole in every area that you have need. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the mighty name of Yeshua, I bless you. And all God's people said, Amen. So, I thank you for coming out tonight, and um, I hope uh, it was worthwhile.